Hi, I'm Tom Reese from Network Ninja, and I'm here today with Matt Boschnik, also of Network Ninja. Hi, Tom. I wore the same shirt I did the other day when we tried to record this video, like you said, too. Oh, good. Yeah, me too. Okay, good. So we, yeah, that, won't, that, we won't mess up the intro this time. No, that intro is, it was boring. So This one's definitely not boring, though. No. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, let's talk about HIPAA then. Okay. Cool. It's let's a do very, it. It's a very important topic, as you know, for child advocacy centers and their multidisciplinary yep. teams, but um, it's often misunderstood. And in fact, as you've pointed out on multiple occasions, most people can't even get the acronym right. Yeah, so absolutely. It's not, it's not spelled like hippo. It's not, and that's why we created this presentation. It's called, <laughs> It's Not Spelled Like Hippo. And you actually Indeed. delivered this uh, this year at the 34th Annual Symposium on Child Abuse. Yep. And uh, so many CACs reached out to you and said, this is great. We want you to do it for us. So we decided let's make it into a video. Absolutely. Cool. So this, this, this video is a practical and social worker friendly HIPAA primer, Tom. Excellent. Yeah. So we're going to uh, walk CACs through uh, some key HIPAA concepts, uh, how they apply to their organization, how they apply to our company, Network Ninja and how they apply to our Collaborate case management software. So yep. uh, speaking of which, Matt, why don't you uh, give the folks out there a little bit more info about Collaborate? Collaborate is a customizable framework for nonprofits that provide so social services. And what that means is you can kind of pick and choose from modular functionality that we've written over the years. Um, you can drop that functionality into your framework and then we can tailor it to meet the exact requirement. So it's a hybrid of you know, a box product and a fully customized implementation. Um, and it kind of benefits from the, the best parts of both of those types of products. Excellent. So now we know a little bit about Collaborate. So let's get back to HIPAA now. Let's dive right in. Matt, we know it's not spelled like HIPPO, but what exactly is HIPAA? How is it spelled? And what do uh, the folks out there need to know about it? Sure. So HIPAA is H-I-P-A-A, -A, and it's Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So yeah, I can't, I could count how many emails I get with the subject line spelled H-I-P-P-A. And when I get those, I know I understand that there's a lot of concern and there's a lot of concepts floating around, but what I can tell when I get that H-I-P-P-A, you know, spelled like HIPPO email, I can tell that they haven't really done their research yet. And I understand that because the research that we've done over you know, many, many years has taken a lot of time and a lot of expertise and a lot of effort and a lot of energy. So um, totally get it. But after this talk, you know, um, hopefully it will help people get up to speed and feel a little bit more comfortable about their understanding of the concepts. For sure. And uh, as I understand it, HIPAA is uh, sort of this national standard, right, that's, uh, that's geared at protecting individuals' personal health information. Exactly. Yeah, that's the that's the gist of it. So um, HIPAA, in a nutshell, you know, as you said, a national standard, the objective is to protect PHI or personal health information. And um, it requires that these organizations have safeguards to protect privacy. Um, and the objective is to limit um, disclosures and limit use of data that's clinical and medical in nature. So um, one of the things that it requires is patient authorization for some disclosures. Um, and the, another thing, another fundamental concept of it is that the client or the patient, you know, we're going to use client and patient interchangeably here, but um, the patient has the right to examine their case files. And that means in their entirety. Sure. And we'll get some more into that later on, exactly what everything that's included in those case files might be, because it's not just uh, interviews and, and documentation, things like that. But there's a lot more to it as well that they're supposed to be allowed access to. But, yeah. um, but, but moving on now, let's talk about who HIPAA actually applies to. Uh, essentially, there are two different entities at, at play here, right? Sure. So there's two fundamental concepts that um, HIPAA applies to or, or organization types. And those are covered entities. So covered entities or CEs um, in the language of HIPAA, they're healthcare providers as it actually pertains to CACs. Um, so if the organization provides clinical or medical services, they're probably a covered entity under HIPAA. And, and this 
talk is important to them. Um, the other concept, the uncovered entity, which is you know our client. Um, the other concept is business associate. So we're a business associate. We're a vendor. Um, Network Ninja is our company, and we are a BA. Um, if your vendors need access to health information or could accidentally be exposed to health information um, on like a more regular basis than on a fluke, uh, they're probably a BA and you should consider them to be a BA. So business associate is BA, that's us. And then covered entity is, is presumably the folks that are watching this. Got it, got it. And uh, closely rela related rather to BAs or business associates, there's also something called a BAA or a business associate agreement. Can you explain what that is and why that's so important? Yeah, I mean, if a covered entity has a relationship with a business associate, chances are they need to get a BAA in place, which is a business associate agreement. Um, now, that is a requirement of the covered entity at this point, not of the business associate, of the vendor. So. Um, in our scenarios, like we have taken to actually providing the client with a BAA to provide to us in turn so that they can have that in place. Uh, a lot of our, you know, nonprofits um, don't necessarily, not all of them at least are lucky enough to have like a, an attorney on their board or uh, um, affiliation with a hospital that has attorneys on staff and things like that. So um, sometimes they don't even know that they're required to have them in place. And sometimes they maybe if they're required or if they know that they're required, they don't have the, the resources to do so. So um, one way or another, covered entity and business associate, those two orgs should have a BAA in place if the business associate is handling data in any way. Gotcha. Gotcha. So getting back to covered entities now, uh, these folks have certain responsibilities when it comes to protecting health information. So brace yourselves, yep. guys. This list is a little bit long, but uh, we're going to start with a very important concept called risk analysis. So Matt, yep. what do CACs need to know about those? So yeah, at first we'll talk about, we should talk about the responsibilities of the covered entity, and then we can move on to, to discuss the responsibilities of the business associate. But the risk analysis is a responsibility of all covered entities. So um, this is not like a suggestion. This is a requirement. So the CE must perform a risk analysis uh, and must document the results. So the objective here again is simply to identify any and all ways PHI could be at risk. So if it could be if it's being disclosed or used on purpose, that's sort of part of it. If it could be disclosed or used by a third party in a strange way that you didn't expect, that's another one. So the objective is to go through every scenario you can think of and come up with um, mitigating uh, procedures. Got it. And now what can CACs do to help manage these risks? Because they've got to do that initial analysis. Now, how do they manage those risks that they, that they do turn up in that analysis? Perfect. Yeah. So risk management is another like HIPAA concept. It's not a it's not a, a loosey-goosey term. It, it's a very specific term, um, and it applies to covered entities. So one of the things that they're required to do is implement safeguards to reduce the identified risks. So during that, that analysis, they will identify risks. And during the risk management process, which is ongoing forever and ever, they will implement and manage safeguards to reduce the, uh, the identified risks. So again, the the requirement here is that you reduce. So reduce possibility of accidental disclosure, reduce your liability in turn. That's the objective. The requirement is not to eliminate 100% um, the, the opportunities for accidental disclosure because it's not possible. It, it's probably not possible. It's not possible sure. unless you're not actually doing your job. So um, these, the management of risk applies to both physical as well as technology, like both physical security and technological security. So software security is, is what we're going to talk about later on. But right now, we're going to talk about physical security of the covered entity and physical and, and software security of the covered entity as well. Right. So now that we've done this risk analysis, we have some concepts uh, here of risk management, implementing safeguards. Um, 
now we can move on to how CICs could manage and train the users properly to reduce yeah. those risks. Risks. Yeah. So, uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So one of the other responsibilities, you know, and that's what we're talking about now is, is covered entity or CAC responsibilities, but the user management um, and policy training efforts of the CE need to be documented, but also, I mean, they should be in place as well as documented. So, I mean, one of the things that you need to do is train all staff, all employees um, regarding security and how it relates to uh, PHI. Um, Another thing that's like sort of funny, I bring it up, but sanctions on rule, bo rule breakers are really important. So um, if you've got a user that keeps failing to comply with your organization's requirements for security, um, you must sanction them and you must document that. So, uh, you know, my joke uh, is uh, no corporal punishment, but <laughs> like <laughs> uh, something has to be done. And a lot of people, um, they don't feel comfortable with that. But the objective, again, is if somebody in the future comes in and goes, all right, so you had a major disclosure. Um, one of your staff members did something that they shouldn't have. Uh, what did you do to, well, did you, did you identify this during your risk analysis? And then um, how did you propose to manage that risk in the future, you know? Mm -hmm. And then what did you do when this user kept making these mistakes, these same mistakes? Did you document it? Did you reprimand them? Did you fire it? Whatever it is, you know? And right. if, you do, if you say I did nothing, they're gonna go, well, you know, the liability, you know, clearly falls upon you now. And if they said, nah, man, we did all of these different things and, and it still happened, um, that's a very, very different story. So again, the objective is to reduce, well, reduce accidental disclosure, of course, is the, the primary concept, but reducing liability for the organization itself is also part of this. So it's not just all HIPAA, it's how HIPAA enforcement will work in the future. Right, and uh, now we'll get a little bit more into some specifics regarding uh, yeah. how you can uh, manage your users, manage the policies, and what specifically that covered entity should be doing uh, in order to, to pull this off correctly. Um, yeah. So let's talk about now access management. It's uh, limiting access to computers and accounts in general. It's something that's often overlooked in a lot of organizations. So what do we need to know there? Yeah, I mean, this is both physical and, um, and software and virtual, whatever you want to call it. But um, you need to limit who has access to workstations and devices within the org. Um, and then, you know, like a bunch of ways to do that are following basic rules of like no sharing of accounts is allowed. Um, it's not allowed. Like it's not like a suggestion. It's, it's a requirement. Um, you need to know who's using their account when and they need to be unique per user. Um, so no sharing of accounts. One account equals one human, you know, is what we usually try to try to say. Um, and and you need to limit who has access to these workstations within your network. Um, you need to obviously limit who has access to your case management software too, but um, that's, you know, we'll talk about that as far as our responsibilities go. But um, so, you know, put things like putting passwords on the workstation, the laptop, the tablet, the phone. Again, if it's used to manage medical or clinical data, it must have a password on it, must. Uh, we'll talk about password management stuff too, like soon, but yeah. Um, yeah, so those are some basic things. Access management, again, we're going through kind of bullet points, <laughs> and but we didn't make these bullet points up. You know, these, these are um, extracted from the HIPAA docs, which yep. uh, trying to prevent folks from having to read through hundreds of legalese docs and instead uh, be able to get this data in a digest digestible format. You had two people sure. talking. Naturally, yeah. <laughs> uh, Skype. <laughs> exactly. So uh, you said it there before, Matt, passwords. It's everyone's favorite topic is password management, right? I sure. know you have some strong feelings about this too. So uh, let's hear Yeah. That. Yeah. So, I mean, password management on the covered entity side is actually really important. Um, now, the first step in the process is to define a password policy. Uh, this is extremely exciting stuff, I know, but um, there, there are some actual actionable um, items that, that uh, CEs or RCACs can take. But one of them is do not physically write down passwords unless the intent is to store them in a safe or something like that behind lock and key. So 
this is, um, you know, a pretty fundamental concept that we see accidentally or purposefully being violated. Um, constantly, all, really. Post-it notes stuck to the, the side time. of a monitor with your password on time. it. Get rid of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, don't use the same username and password combination to access any other websites ever under any circumstances. So like this is a really simple concept that folks don't necessarily understand like how their account on one site gets compromised and then that leads to them getting compromised on another site. But let's say that you use the same username and password on Yahoo as you do on Google. And um, now they don't have to hack both Yahoo and Google. If Yahoo's been compromised and you know they have, uh, <laughs> and you haven't changed your password in the last 15 years since you've been using Yahoo and you sign up for a Google account and you're using the same username and password combo, um, it's not that some human is gonna sit there and guess a million different passwords for your account on both of those sites. They're gonna hack one site, compromise millions of accounts on that one, and then they're gonna use those username and password combinations that they've either found stored insecurely or unsecurely on that site or whatever, they're going to use the exact same combination on every website on the internet. Um, right. And, and these are networks of robots working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just trying these hacked usernames and passwords everywhere that yep. they can possibly try to log in on. And it's never ending. It just keeps going on and on every second of the yeah. day. It's nonstop and it, the volume is increasing and it will not stop, you know, <laughs> um, until people stop being compromised. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's, it, again, it's important to stress that the, these efforts are concerted efforts by individuals, but they're running robot networks of software that's out there doing this work for them in quantities of like hundreds of thousands of servers at a time attacking one other server. So, uh, anyway, that's the, the reason why you don't want to use like the same username and password combination to access any other websites. You know, some of the other ones are like, do not use easily guessable passwords. And that seems like a straightforward concept and sort of is, but um, we see people not doing that a lot. So um, also, you know, like do not issue incremental passwords or universal passwords for your organization because what ends up happening is people don't change them. And then, you know, we there's no real PC way to approach it, but you've got to, if you've got, the potential of ever having a rogue employee and all the staff at your shop knows the universal password that you issue accounts with. Well, that is your problem now. Um, if something happens in the future, because somebody goes and they ask you, you know, what's your password management policy and how do you enforce it? And you go, ah, we don't really have one. You go, well, that's your problem. And now that's your fault. So, um, again, these, those, those four items, like don't write down passwords, don't use the same username and password anywhere else. Um, don't use the easily guessable passwords and do not issue standardized passwords or universal passwords for your org. Those are concepts that you can apply anywhere pretty much to become uh, safer. Yeah, those are great security rules of thumb to keep in mind and at work, at home, everywhere um, to, to do those. So uh, we'll dive even deeper, believe it or not, into passwords later on. But let's touch uh, a bit first. Let's take a little break, touch a little bit on uh, a bit of a scary topic, malware. Matt, what is malware and how can organizations avoid that? Sure. So malware avoidance, another one of our HIPAA bullets. But, um, you know, malware is a virus or a Trojan or ransomware or something like that. Uh, there are three steps, you know, guard against malware detect it when it happens and be able to rectify it when it, uh, when you've actually identified it or detected it. So, um, you know, we have a bad story about one of, one of our very good clients, you know, for a long time, but we usually do data migrations when we bring people over from their legacy software into collaborate. And, uh, this one, we weren't doing data migration from, for some reason, and we got to the bottom of it. And it turns out that the reason why is because they had been a victim of ransomware which means somebody hacked their their file share that they had all their data on and uh, and then encrypted it, you know, and they gave them a certain timeline to pay them off, probably, you know, Bitcoin or whatever, and then they didn't pay it in time, and then that's it, you know, they, uh, they lost all their data. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about practical ways of doing that. We're not just talking virus scanners, um, and virus scanning is another topic, but, like, virus scanners are... are 
post or after the fact, you know, virus scanners aren't actually that effective. You need to do user training so people aren't clicking on like snoopy.exe as an attachment in their email asking for bank account information or who knows what's that one going got on. me to snoopy.exe. Yeah. It got me. <laughs> yeah. Love Snoopy. I know yeah. you got a soft spot, yeah. but um, that's the, the, the more the proactive approach that the CACs or, or nonprofits can take is to um, train their users on like, don't, you know, it's hard, it's harsh too, but like, don't be gullible about this stuff because you are under attack and paranoia here is your friend. So, um, you know, don't open apps that you don't know where they came from and windows and OS X or, or Mac OS. Now, um, they have safeguards in place that prevent you from running random stuff on your computer for the most part, but people still do it. We see people work around those safeguards and they'll like disable yep. them so that they can install some random stuff. And, uh, you know, at the same time, we'll also see, uh, shops that have it in place and the it won't let them upgrade their internet explorer or their chrome or whatever their browser is and then the it doesn't manage their computers either but the users can install new software on it it means that they're running out of date software that they can't upgrade and then that's the entry point for the malware at that point when you're running a, a browser with vulnerabilities in it that's how you get hacked so um be paranoid you know, we're not trying to get into the nitty gritty of like every way you should be paranoid moving forward. But um, one of the topics that HIPAA uh, covers is the malware avoidance. Um, and that's the avoidance of viruses, Trojans and ransomware. And one of the steps to that is to be able to rectify it if you become compromised. And uh, and one of the ways to do that is have, you know, good backups that also are not compromised. Sure. That brings us right into the next topic here, which is encryption and storage. Uh, this is extremely yep. important uh, to keep PHI safe, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so one of the first things that we talk about when we start working with new folks is like, absolutely no PHI should be sent via email unless it's encrypted. If you don't know that you're encrypting it actively and it's still a pain in the butt to do that, um, you're not encrypting it. So <laughs> do not send PHI via email under any circumstances. It's not safe. It's not allowed. Um it's not just not advisable. So some of these topics are like, they're not suggestions for the most part, they're requirements. Um, you know, one of the rules of thumb is if you're unsure, assume it's unsafe. Um, however, you're trying to transmit your data. If you're not sure that it's safe, assume that it's unsafe and make the vendor qualify to you how it's safe. You know, uh, another thing is like absolutely no PHI should be stored on personal computers. Um, personal mobile mobile devices or personal hardware. So the key word there is obviously personal. So it should all be on um, work issued stuff or uh, you know devices that are exclusively used for work and are not used for personal purposes. So that that's again that's not a suggestion. That's a requirement. It's not of us, but it's of the covered entity by um, HIPAA in this scenario. But there are other uh, entities that also have similar requirements and and therefore a good reason. Right, exactly right. And uh, we'll get into a little bit more about how Collaborate uh, helps folks on, on the encryption and storage side of things later on. So they're not sending PHI via email and all these other things that yeah. violate HIPAA rules. Um, yeah. But keeping data safe is, is great. Uh, but sometimes it can, you can't even access, access your data. Uh, yeah. You know, if you lose power to the office or if there's a long term internet outage. You might still need yeah. to do some some things like intake or interviews. Um, so, what can CACs do there? They should, they, they should have some sort of plan in place, right? Yeah, yeah. If you can't access or access your data, um, then you need to have what's called a contingency plan for emergency mode. And you know, again, it's another it's another key word. Um, but in the event of a complete outage, you should still be able to operate. And um, there are a lot of really simple ways that you can do that with our collaborate product, but um, one of the ones that sounds silly, but it's totally not, uh, is print out everything. So, and let me qualify I'm that. going actually. old school. <laughs> yeah, print out the forms, the blank forms that you use electronically and have them so that you can fill them out with a pencil um, and, or pen, sorry, it doesn't have to be a pencil, but, um, and then you can enter that stuff into the software when things come back up. So during the storms last year, um, that was actually used, uh, quite a bit in some of our southern southern states, so in the, in the southern region. Um, 
So yeah, this is the simplest one. And this is the one that's really easy for everybody to understand that you need a contingency plan for emergency mode. And that, that is in the event of a complete outage. Um, so easy mode is prepare, prepare for disaster with printouts. Um, really hard mode is like having a UPS that can power everything for multiple days and um, having satellite internet or something like that. But um, we're, we're probably going to go with easy mode for here for our suggestion and best practice. Yeah, that's that's what most uh, CACs out there certainly are, are probably capable of is the easy mode stuff. Easy enough. Print, print those forms out. Keep them on hand. So you always have them just in case. And yeah. uh, now we've covered mo many of the most important HIPAA topics for covered entities. And we're yeah. going to move now on to more of technology or software specific stuff, uh, things that you can do with Collaborate um, to help you record, manage, protect confidential data, including PHI of your clients. So Matt, uh, kick it off. Tell us a little bit about Collaborate's encryption methods. Sure. So, well, th some of the requirements of your business associate or your vendor or your technology vendor, or your software company, whatever they are, um, we're going to walk through those individually now. Uh, and some of the things that we do in order to maintain your compliance for you um, or on behalf of you is, you know, one of the first ones is encryption. So everything to and from destination is encrypted. Um, you're required or we're required to encrypt data at rest. So it's on, you know, data that's not actively being used needs to be stored in an encrypted manner. Um, you also need to, you know, we encrypt backups. We encrypt our backups of backups that are stored at a different location in a different account. Um, and then any communications, including like our maintenance stuff that we do uh, when we do security monitoring or even scanning or, and then the subsequent patching and all of that stuff, it's done over an encrypted tunnel. So everything to and from the server should be encrypted. Everything on the server should be encrypted and then the backups and then the backups of the backups should be encrypted. So um, that is, you know, something that is fundamental to having security. If you're not using encryption or not using encryption properly, then you are not compliant. So um, one of the other things too that like folks don't necessarily think about is again, try to remember that we're trying to reduce the likelihood of an accidental disclosure or a, uh, you know, somebody's PHI getting out there that we didn't want it to. So what this allows you to do is, you know, like what people aren't necessarily going to spend the hundreds or thousands of hours on a supercomputer to crack your data unless they have a really, really, really good reason. But if your data is being sent in clear text or stored in clear text, well, it's really easy. The, the barrier to entry there is none. There is none. So they're going to read your data and it will most likely be disclosed. So again, the objective is just to make it really hard for an attacker or really hard for somebody to make a mistake that could disclose that data accidentally. So one of the ways of doing that is encryption. Um, another thing that this does is you know, you're not always, again, under attack by an individual. Nobody's targeting our clients, probably, sure. uh, at least. What, what's happening is there, you know, like uh, somebody sitting in between your computer and the server on a compromised switch, you know, on a network device somewhere, and they're sniffing all the traffic. They're, they're listening to all the traffic that goes from server to the client in hopes of finding something unencrypted. And if you're sending... Um, anything clear text, they'll see it because they're looking at everything that that goes by there. So um, that's another thing that, that encryption protects you from. And now in 2018, you know, the collaborate doesn't even allow itself to be accessed via non encryption means, you know, and it hasn't for years. But, um, you know, if you're, unfortunately, a lot of the, the stuff that we're migrating from, you know, it's bittersweet. Um, but we can solve these problems we already have, but the legacy software that they're using uh, allows it to be accessed via non-encrypted means, which means that you're sending data clear text across the internet and people don't understand the significance of that, uh, how significant it is, but it's, a, it's, it's terrible. Yeah, the bottom line there is if your PHI data is not encrypted, you're not going to be HIPAA compliant, period. That's just how it is. So um, another critical piece of the security puzzle here, Matt, is ensuring that only the correct people have access to sensitive information, right? Yeah, so limiting who has access to what to like on a need to know basis. You know, you've heard this in the movies, but it really is a need to know. If they don't need to know, ah, oh, can't hurt. No, don't show, don't share the data with them. 
Um, so some examples of how it applies to HIPAA, you know, limit clinical to clinical staff. So your therapy notes, your treatment plans, your progress notes, your clinical testing, all of that stuff, only clinical staff staff should be able to see that data. Um, a step further than that, you know, there's some circumstances where our clients only their clinical staff can only see their own therapy notes, but they can't see other therapists notes, those types of things. So within collaborate, you can use what we call roles and permissions to grant and deny access to different areas of data based on someone's role within the multidisciplinary team. So, you know, another example, limit medical to medical staff. So medical data should only be viewable by medical staff. Um, you can, you know, you can still do your aggregate reports on it. Uh, you know, how many medical exams did we provide this year um, to mail clients between the ages of whatever, but um, you can, should not be sharing the medical exam with the client's name and address any personally identifiable information beyond aggregate interest. That's right. Now I promised everyone earlier, if you remember, that we talk about passwords some more because everybody oh, yeah. loves this. Let's get there. So the time has come. Uh, what are the best practical, pragmatic practices for creating and using passwords? Sure. So unique usernames, you know, no shared users. We talked about that in Collaborate. It doesn't allow you to use shared users, shared accounts. Um, we, so in the past and still legacy vendors are still using these concepts, but, um, in the past, okay. There was an interview recently with the, it's a dude that made these guidelines for NIST in the past. So National Institute of Standards and Technology, they recently came out with new password guidelines that make a lot more sense, um, because the old ones were counterproductive. They actually made things worse. So the, in the interview, the guy was like, it's the thing that I regret most it either said in my life or during my career that I made these suggestions. So it's a big um, regret. Yeah, it's a pretty big one. So, <laughs> you know, they no longer recommend forced password resets. You're not supposed to change your password every three months anymore. Um, you change your password if you believe it's been compromised, but you do not change it for no reason. It is counterproductive to force password resets. Um, you know, another one of the, the guidelines is never use the same password on more than one site, unique passwords. We already talked about that. Um, you know, strong, but memorizable long phrases of random words. Those are much more safe than, um, than using some crazy password that you can't remember that you write down and put on your monitor. So that's the reason in the, the pivot from, you know, contra before contradict these new these new guidelines. But the one way to use technology to make this stuff easy for you is to use a password manager. So in order to do that, well, it's, the reason why you would do that is you only have to remember one long password for your password manager, and then you store random passwords for every account you have in that password manager. So the only one you really care about as a human is the one that you use to get into your password manager. And then everything else in there should be randomly generated, either long passphrases. It is not a bad idea to mix cases and put numbers in there. But what it really comes down to is the point is like, you shouldn't be memorizing any passwords anymore beyond the one that you use to get into your password manager. And again, it really like strong, but memorizable long phrases of random words. And you'd be surprised what you can remember if you can put 10 words together, then that's great. So that, mm -hmm. that's, that, that is the new NIST guidelines. Um, not a bunch of random stuff that, uh, that we see still in practice at, you know, some of the hospitals that we work with and other types of agencies that don't quite, anyway, they don't, they don't spend quite as much time thinking about this stuff. And now collaborate also includes a robust roles and permission system, uh, that's customized for each implementation along with access control lists. So tell us a little bit about those two concepts, Matt. Yeah. So you want to prevent folks from having access that shouldn't have access to certain data. Um, you also want to grant super user access based on certain criteria. So some of this is nerd stuff, but it <laughs> pertains to software and it also applies really directly to our CAC clients and our nonprofits. But, you know, one of the things that we do and any of your packages should do is IP filtering for super user accounts. So what it means is Unless you come from a certain network, um, 
There are certain IP addresses you don't have access to super user functionality. But if you are coming from certain IP addresses, you do have access to it. So you can limit it on that basis. You can even say like, nobody can log in from this network because this network is the home IP address of a staff member that went rogue and whatever. So you can block certain IP addresses out and you can allow other IP addresses certain different levels of access um, just by seeing where they're coming in from on, on their network. So you can use this with your VPN and that's how it's typically used at these shops that we work with where like everybody goes through the VPN and then um, and then you set it up so that Collaborate can only receive inbound connections from that IP address, the VPN IP address. Uh, the cool thing about that too is that you could set up like intern role or something like that can ac access the data from anywhere, but they can only access like very small tidbits of data and only cases they're assigned to, something like that. The other thing that you can do is role-based access. So uh, that means simply that if your medical staff, for example, um, your admin will have configured your role so that you have access to cases that you've been assigned to perhaps, and maybe you can create and edit uh, medical exam services on those cases, but you can't uh, edit medical exams on other cases. And in some scenarios, you can't even view medical exams on other cases. So same thing goes with, you know, most of our, most of our, well, a lot of our CAC clients, at least a lot of our nonprofits clients, nonprofit clients, they have um, therapists or cl other clinical staff that, you know, they should probably only have access to their own therapy notes, not other therapy notes, that type of thing. So roles and permissions, you can get really, really granular, uh, really sophisticated as far as who has access to what, when, um, you know, over the past 20 years, we've kind of experienced and been exposed to many different requirements, mm -hmm. um, security requirements, and we've, you know, fleshed out roles and permissions based on that. Cool. And it all just goes back to the need to know concept, right? If, if you yeah, don't need to indeed. know, set up that, that, uh, that the permissions for that role to only allow them to know what they need to know. And that's it. Yeah. And beyond that too, like you, you want to start off by granting them as little privilege as possible so that they're forced to ask for more, because if you give them too much to begin with, you're never going to hear about it again. So one of the things we do during interview and discoveries, we spend a lot of time working with our clients, um, trying to explain to them how other folks have done it successfully, how they should probably do it in their practice. Um, you know, and of course we work with them closely to learn about how they operate in the real world, uh, too, to, to try to make sure that they're not doing anything that they shouldn't be unknowingly, um, in the real world that they, uh, shouldn't be doing in software either. Got it. Now let's get into, uh, another concept I know that's near and dear to your heart, Matt, logging. And I'm not yeah. referring to being a lumberjack out there in, in no. the Pacific Northwest, no. where you uh, recently moved to. Uh, we're, we're talking about yeah, we're talking about storing metadata like dates, times, access information, and things like when data's changed. Logging that uh, on the server. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we take it even beyond metadata, and we talk about you know very specifically logging literally everything. So um, someone accesses a case file is logged. Someone changes data in a case file, we log what they changed it from and what they changed it to. So you have a history of everything that takes place. Um, this is not a suggestion. This is a requirement. So uh, you need to have an audit trail of everything that takes place in the software. So we've got really, really sophisticated logging and really sophisticated logging interface that allows you to see everything that's taken place over the course of the case's history now. One of the other things that's pretty important here is that one of the reasons or one of the ways that this can be used is during an audit, but also one of the ways that this can be used is uh, when your client says, what's up, I want my case file, you can dump their case file as you are required to. So just to be clear, some folks think that because they're not using good software, they don't have to abide by these rules and regulations, and they still do, they just don't have the capability to respond to it if something actually were to happen. So um, you don't get an out by not collecting the data you're required to collect. You actually just have no defense in that scenario. So it's really important to log everything. And yeah. Not yeah, I think a teacher once told me one time that ignorance is not a defense. Oh, wow. That's harsh words from your teacher. Yeah. But I, yeah. That one hurt, but uh, it was true. 
and it still holds yeah, true I today. Agree. <laughs> I agree with it. So now moving on from logging to logins, uh, mm, how does nice. how does collaborate monitor user logins and potential security events that might take place with those with with users logging in? Yeah, so login monitoring and uh, monitoring and logging of security events is, uh, is something that's really important to do um, when you're working with uh, HIPAA HIPAA related data. So, um, for example. Suspicious activity should lock user accounts or in some scenarios the entire networks out. So like what we do is if, for example, there's multiple security events um, from the same IP address and it there's criteria that you can set to determine what looks like an attack and what looks like a fumbling user. Um, and they're very different. So um, multiple security issues for the same IP address over a certain period of time will lock that IP address out entirely. Now, there's there's the risk of a denial of service attack by doing that, but that still means that there's a bad actor at that IP address, and we want to be aware of it. So it's safe, better safe than sorry. So we shut the IP address off, and you know the admins have the access to actually reset these security events too, but they can dig into it and see what's going on. So um, sometimes, you know, like and. It, Totally. We have, uh, we can tell when the interns are back after their spring break or summer vacation or whatever it is, because um, we get at least a couple of our larger centers will call us or, you know, when the newer larger centers and, hey, what's up? We're locked out for some reason. It's like, yeah, well, 12 of your interns tried to log in at the same time. Each of them logged in with the wrong password more than 10 times in a span of 10 minutes. So yeah, it looked like some you were under attack. So collaborate <laughs> shut you down automatically. Um, that you know it happens once, and then they learn to not do that anymore, or the admin learns how to reset it. So sure, but that's an example of what it what went like a false positive. <laughs> but um, some other stuff that like security that would trigger a, a security event um, would be you know the attempted unauthorized database activity. So trying to like circumvent maybe try to type in a URL that you don't have access to or change an ID number somewhere, um, access like a service that you don't have access to multiple times. Uh, it'll create a security event and potentially lock that user out. Um, in some scenarios, lock the IP address out if it's happening across a bunch of different users at the same time. Um, other things too, like there's multiple login attempts for the same user account. That's a pretty simple one, but you know, you log in, you can set the thresholds and everything, but set it up so you, if you log in 10 times and you still don't remember your password, it looks like collaborating is under attack. So, you know, come on, like use a password manager and it solves all these problems. But if you're not, it, you know, it looks like a legitimate attack. So um, multiple login attempts from the same IP address. You know, another big one is like if, if we see logins or if we being software at this point um, sees logins for the same user account at like different IP addresses at the same time. That also looks really bad. So, you know, sometimes, yeah, I mean, we've many times shut down accounts as people have been trying to access an account that's actively logged in from a different state. Um, we can tell that somebody's attempting to compromise them. And again, just like this isn't a this isn't a collaborate thing. This isn't a network ninja thing. This isn't a, a case management software thing. This is a twenty four seven three sixty five uh, automated scanning by botnets that happens on every piece of software we use all day, every day. So, I mean, your home router is being scanned and attempted to be exploited <laughs> all the time. If you were to look at the logs, you would just see it be nonstop. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do to protect, but the only way to really do it is to be able to do it in an automated manner at scale. And that's something that we do really well. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, one human being sitting there watching this stuff would never be able to do it. So we let the software uh, do the heavy lifting uh, and, 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 exactly. and help protect uh, people for that way. So uh, yeah. wrapping up our list of security topics here now, Matt, it's the concept of physically limiting access to computers, facilities, and even old unused hardware, like hard drives and stuff like that. So yeah. uh, what, what do the folks need to know uh, about what, what we do on that end? Yeah, so I mean, for us at least, and these same rules apply to, to them, but um, we've workstation use standards and security standards in place. So, uh, you know, shouldn't be installing snoopy.exe on your computer if you plan to use it for work, that type of thing, I told you. But, yeah. um, 
you know, we also require the volumes on laptops and desktops alike to be encrypted. So, you know, Mac has a really nice file vault feature that allows you to encrypt your whole disk. Um, Linux has cool stuff where you can encrypt your home directories and, uh, you know, Windows has some add-ons that you can use for encryption like this that are, are equally as strong. Um, but having encrypted desktop is not really an option anymore. It should be a requirement. So, uh, because, you know, we have to keep in mind that if you're not running an encrypted volume on your workstation, then somebody can just take that disk out of your computer and put it in theirs and open your files. You know what I mean? So the password's important, no but it doesn't matter. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, so just I want to repeat that so that people understand that just putting like a pin number on it doesn't mean that it's encrypted and I can take that drive out and put it in my drive and, and read everything on your disk unless it's encrypted. And, and again, if when in doubt, assume it's not because it's not, it's not that it, nobody did it for you probably. So, um, Anyway, another really important thing for us is at least uh, we've, you know, we used to have, I don't know, 60 servers in Iraq and now we've got four because everything is virtualized. Um, as you can imagine, as we phased out all those physical servers, we had to trash a lot of stuff. And sure. so what we did to do that, we would like, it's not a matter of erasing things on a disk and then throwing it out and going, oh, okay, cool. Um, it's super easy to recover erased files via traditional means. So what we do as an example is we trash it, overwrite, we, we erase it and we overwrite it and we overwrite it and we overwrite it. <laughs> it takes hours and then we grind them up. So like literally give it to a vendor to grind up the drives. Uh, that is the safe way to dispose of old hardware um, of drives and, and things like that. So you know, Good you luck get getting the data off it at that point once it's ground yeah. up into a million pieces. Yeah. I defy well, that, anyone to try and uh, steal your data at that point. It comes down, it's the same thing as shredding stuff too, right? So yeah. if you throw a bunch of paper in a trash dumpster outside the back of your shop, that was very weirdly specific, but like <laughs> if you're just throwing paper out, um, anybody can pick it up and look at it and they'll look at all of it and maybe there's something interesting in there. Uh, but the the barrier to do that, the barrier to entry is, uh, is low. Well, there is none. But if you shred it, okay, so let's say you shred it the one direction. You shred it the one direction, it'll take them hours to put it back together, but it's pretty easy. Um, and so they can do that. So what you do instead is you use a cross-cut shredder. And now that cuts it in a couple different directions. And they're smaller pieces, so they're harder to put together. And then you put a lock on your dumpster too. Okay, so like you have done a lot you've taken a lot of different steps to make this way harder for someone to access your data you know again somebody could go through that you could burn it and somebody's going to be able to retrieve some information from that trash but the the amount of time it would take is so significant that it's impractical and that's what we're trying to do here is make it impractical or really unlikely for an accidental disclosure to take place uh and, you know, that applies really easily to physical security. You know, the same thing with backups and storage. Like if, if your backups aren't good, then you don't have backups. If your backups are untested, then you don't have backups. You know, if your backups are not encrypted, then you have created a new liability by taking data that you're securing in other ways and backing it up in a way that, you know, if somebody can walk out of your office with a tape of unencrypted files on it, like that's terrible. And well, it's not allowed, you know, you're in violation, you're not compliant. So um, for us, you know, our backups, our backups are not stored on the server itself, right? Um, so backups of the server are stored somewhere else and they're encrypted. And then backups of those backups are stored at a different location and they're encrypted and they're under a totally separate account. So again, our objective is like may maybe we have more standards or different standards to apply to our business, like as a software vendor. Um, but these concepts, they apply to everybody. So these types of things, these things are, are what folks should be thinking about. Simple stuff like physical access to servers. You know, we don't let clients self-host because <laughs> when they do that, um, we end up 
getting a call because somebody kicked the network card out of the server accidentally. I mean, we haven't done it in over a decade, but, <laughs> um, you know, and so in the past when we use co-location facilities, you needed a, an ID, you needed, you would biometric to get in. You had, were escorted with an armed guard to the rack and then they would unlock the cage that our servers were in and let us work on them. Like that, is the level of security that we used to have. And now it's even better, you know, because with the virtualization that we use, you know, nobody has access to our server physically that shouldn't, like no, nobody else can get into that facility. So um, sure. limiting physical access to servers and limiting physical access to workstations, again, physical access is a big deal. Like what, one thing that people don't realize is that the, one of the most successful attack methods is physical or uh, sort of virtual, but using social engineering where right. somebody could compromise a staff member by asking them questions that they should not be answering to a stranger, you know? So, um, yeah, so physical and just like fundamental real world practices uh, is most of what HIPAA is concerned with. And, and a lot of what it's requiring covered entities to do is actually very reasonable. Um, the, the, the problem with what the requirements the problem is how the requirements are delivered to the covered entity and, you know, and, and it's hard, you know? So again, when we get the, when we get the email, unless it's a joke, um, that's H I P P A, I know I'm in for <laughs> a long conversation because a lot of assumptions have been made. A lot of, uh, incorrect information has been relayed to them. And, uh, and, you know, just frankly, no research has been done on their part because it, it had they would realize that it's not spelled like that because they would have seen it used in the documentation every 10 words you know what i mean so right right uh, right well matt thanks so much i really enjoyed it i've learned a lot myself here today uh, unfortunately though we've come to the end of our presentation um so, hopefully folks as you just mentioned at least hopefully they know how to spell hipaa properly now uh, yeah and just if you need to remember that just remember it's not spelled like hippo and uh, if you have any questions about this presentation or about Collaborate, just come visit us at collaboratesoftware.com. Shoot us an email at collaborate at networkninja.com. And we've also put together a detailed primer document about these and other HIPAA topics that you can download below. Feel free to share it with all the members of your organization and any other colleagues in your field you think could benefit from it. Uh, but thanks so much, guys. Matt, thank you. And we hope thanks, to Tom. see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. All right. See ya. Bye-bye.